Welcome to the week two content. This week we'll be learning about kingdom fungi. Our labs will be about fungi, our lectures will be about fungi, and our collecting trip, if you go, will be about fungi. So here is my fungal haiku. Invisible force, connecting, building, wrecking through digestive threads. Okay, so first, with any group we cover, we'll look at the characteristics used to place an organism into that group. So this is part of this larger classification system where we have to decide, we don't have to, Western science likes to decide what box something goes into. And then within that box, we have increasingly more specific boxes um, like Russian nesting dolls. So to be a fungus, there are a set of requirements here. Um, and normally um, I have a, I would be writing on the screen and you would write them down with me. And it's a way for me to pace my lectures for my students to take notes. However, the um, writing system in this Canvas Studio program is very slow and the, the handwriting is hard to, for it to pick up. Um, so I'm not going to write at the same time as you, unfortunately, um, but I will cover all these characteristics one by one. And you can pause now um, and write them down. So all fungi are eukaryotic. That means that their cells have a nucleus and they have membrane-bound organelles. It's a very complex cell structure capable of doing a lot of different things. Um, so cells have this higher ability to sort of specialize um, and have like a, a command center that regulates what's going on within that cell. They are heterotrophic. That means that they consume other organisms in some way. They don't make their own food, but they have to get their um, organic energy sources from other organisms. Um, and so fungi do that by absorption. They barf out their enzymes, they excrete them to their exterior surface, and then digest their food externally, then absorb it. So this is different from us, where we put our food into our body and digest it in there. Our insides are this network of thin tubes that are compressed into our body, um, but if you were to extend them, they'd be quite long. So that's because that maximizes our surface area that we can secrete, excrete, digestive enzymes, and break down our food. Fungi are the same, but they're doing it outside. So they have these filamentous long tubes of bodies because they're digesting their food in the, a similar way that we are, but opposite, right? So they live within their food, try to maximize their surface area for interacting with that food by having this long filamentous thallus. That's another characteristic of fungi. Some fungi are unicellular, and that we're going to call those yeasts, but most fungi produce what's called um, a mycelium, which is made up of hyphae. So they're unicellular as yeasts or producing a mycelium, and we'll look more at each of those, what those mean. They have spores as propagules. So as we'll see when we look at plants, different groups of plants will have different propagules. Some will use spores. Some will use pollen and seeds. So fungi use spores. It's part of what unites them as a group. And those spores are haploid. They have one set of chromosomes. These are terms that I'm going to use a lot. Haploid and diploid. And for fungi, I'll even use this weird term, dikaryotic, which means two different haploid nuclei that have not fused together. So they have haploid spores as propagules. Their cell walls contain chitin. Most of the groups that we will look at in botany have cell walls. Animal cells don't have cell walls. So that's a way that we can differentiate animals from other groups of organisms. Most groups covered in botany are sort of united by um, like being non-modal um, and having cell walls mostly. That's it's really the only thing that unites them. Um, and this propagation by spores. So fungal cell walls have chitin in them. Plant cells will have a different component um, and that's going to be cellulose and we'll see that in most of the other groups. So this really distinguishes fungi from other groups studied in botany. Um, chitin is a common compound found in arthropod exoskeletons. So the skeletons of like crustaceans and insects um, you would find chitin there. And this is part of this clue that fungi are actually more closely related to animals than they are to most of these other groups. So cell walls with chitin, 
their cell membranes contain a steroid called, um, or a sterol called ergosterol. And that word might be partially familiar, familiar, that sterol part. That's because animals have cholesterol. So cholesterol is the lipid in our cell membranes that keeps them um, watertight and um, allows us uh, some insulation sort of properties. In fungi, it's similar, but slightly different. So it's ergosterol, and that's a chemical compound we can look for. We're trying to identify a mystery organism to see what it is. If it has ergosterol in its cell membranes, it's likely that it's a fungus. And then we could look and see if it has these other traits as well. Their storage carbohydrate is glycogen. So all of um, our organisms that we'll look at will have some way to store energy for later. We do this with glycogen where we take glucose molecules and we build them into this complex um, carbohydrate and that carbohydrate is glycogen. For plants, it'll be starch and you're familiar with starch because we eat starch and break it down. Um, so ours is glycogen and it's also glycogen for the fungi. The heterotrophic groups that we'll look at store their starch as glycogen, or not starch, store their carbohydrates <laughs> as glycogen. So all of these characteristics are present in organisms that we have classified as kingdom fungi. Let's look at the body plan. So we have two major options here. We have a unicellular form, which has evolved multiple times in different groups of fungi. It isn't some ancestral condition, it's something that's derived. So something that has evolved independently within this group multiple times, this ability to be unicellular. So unicellular fungi are called yeasts. Um, they tend to reproduce by just blobbing off a new little yeast, it's called budding. You'll read about it in your lab and in the textbook reading. So here are a bunch of yeast cells that are reproducing. This one is budding off a new little yeast cell. This one's budding off two. And it leaves a little circular scar. So you can see how many times a yeast has reproduced by looking for these little circular scars on them. They sort of glow under the microscope. You can do this by getting active dry yeast at the grocery store and rehydrating it in some warm water uh, with a little bit of sugar or in some warm milk that um, stimulates the yeast to wake up because they now have water, they have a food source, and they're warm. So that wakes them up and then they start reproducing. So you just make a little slurry of that, wait till it starts to get kind of bubbly, and then put just a tiny, tiny, tiny bit of it under your microscope because it'll look like just a, a tan mass because it's just unicellular. So you want to take a little bit of it and dilute it in some water so you can see the individual cells more clearly. And I encourage you to experiment with that and the quantities that are most useful to look at. Okay, so that's yeasts. The other option for fungi is to make these long filamentous tubes called hyphae. So their cell structure is a long tubular cell. In earlier groups, these aren't divided up into multiple compartments, it's just one long tube. In later groups, they'll start to specialize and get these sort of cellular components to their hyphal cells. So hyphae is like multiple and hypha is singular. So if I took off this E here, it would be hypha. So if I'm referring to one filament, it's a hypha. If I'm referring to many, it's hyphae. And then I could call that the mycelium or hyphae might be the more correct way to pronounce it. So here it is, growing within its substrate. These would be exuding enzymes that would be breaking down this material, which looks like it might be wood. Fungi are often found growing in wood. They have modal cells with one flagellum. So a flagellum is um, this movement-oriented cellular component. I was going to call it a device. Um, humans have, um, if we do have modal cells, they only have one flagellum, so sperm. That's what you'd be thinking of there. Um, a sperm cell is modal and it has a single flagellum that doesn't have any ornamentation on it. It's called a whiplash flagellum. Fungi have the same thing. They're in this larger group with us called the apistocons, which means one flagellum. So only some earlier groups of fungi have flagella at all, but when they do have it, it's the single whiplash flagellum just like us. It's one of the things that puts fungi closer to us in our evolutionary history. 
I'm going to start the fungal phylogeny on the next video.